Yesterday, uh, several members of the church, uh, and I know two teams from the elementary school as well, um, took part in a county relay race. Have you guys heard of that in Amberg Sulzbach? So there's 11 legs to it. It's usually about 60 kilometer, a 60 kilometer race, and you tag out each, each team. Uh, it's a really cool local event, uh, kind of at the beginning of spring each year to get people outside and get people running and exercising again. Um, and I, I got plugged in to do a leg of the race. You know it's desperate when Daylin, Daylin usually coordinates it. When she asked me to do a leg, uh, I know she's, she's scratching the bottom of the barrel. Um, so I did a leg, and this verse was running through my head, um, especially as we're going to look at Hebrews 12 together. I want to read uh, verses 1 to 13, Hebrews 12. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight. I was wishing I could lay aside a lot of weight yesterday. (laughs) We were running up a hill, and I could have laid aside about 30 pounds, gladly. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily, easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as two sons. My son, Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Chasten's a word we don't use a lot, and it's in this passage quite a bit. Um, Discipline is probably a word that we use a lot more often. If you are without discipline, chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and you are not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us or disciplined us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." Now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. That's really the spirit of that that hymn that we just sang, It Is Well With My Soul. The idea is... No matter what is going against me, no matter what, is, what I'm going through, if, if sea billows roll, I still trust God that, okay, God, if that's what you're allowing, if that's what you're putting in my life, this is the discipline you as my Father are giving me. It is well with my soul. I can, I can do this. I can keep going. I will strengthen my hands which hang down and my feeble knees. And so this passage is really talking about the Christian life, this race that we have. But it's interesting, in talking about the race that's before us, he goes to human parenting as an illustration of what God is doing with us. And I kind of want to go backwards. In order to learn about human parenting and learn, learn about parenting our children, I want to look at what God does for us to, to get lessons from what God does as far as what we should be doing. Let me, let me just pray and then we'll, we'll jump in. God, no one likes to be told how to parent their children, and I'm about to try to do that. So God, I I realize going in, um, it's going to be easy for people to be offended, for people's feelings to be hurt, for people to come up with a ton of reasons to tune me out. And, And that's not such a big deal, but God, I pray that they would not tune out your word. I pray that they would not tune your Holy Spirit out. So God, as I'm about to preach, I pray that the things that are just my thoughts and my opinions, that you would make that clear in people's minds, that they can take that or leave it. Help them to to think about that and consider it and then then give it the, the thought that it's worth. 
But the things that are from your word, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would not allow people to, to ignore them. I pray that they wouldn't take it or leave it. I pray that we would not be so arrogant as to assume we can evaluate your word for what we like and don't like. That we would accept and that we would follow scripture no matter, no matter if it agrees with, with our preferences or not. We pray in Christ's name, amen. We talked uh, a couple, several months ago about uh, one sermon just about parent, family in general. And so we hit on marriage and then for about 15, 20 minutes we talked about parenting from Ephesians. And Ephesians 6 um, says, You fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's kind of a dual, a dual perspective there. Training means discipline, correction, and then admonition means teaching, instruction. So, so we're supposed to teach our children things, we're supposed to put things into their hearts, into their minds, and then we're supposed to correct them, and we're supposed to discipline them as they veer and go away from those teachings. Um, but, but how do we do that? Especially because Ephesians says, do not provoke your children to wrath, which we talked about inflaming them, making them angry. And then Colossians says, don't discourage them, don't crush their spirits. And so we as parents have this challenging path of teaching and disciplining our children without inflaming them and without crushing them. And, and now, as you know, we're trying to come back to some of these topics and to trying to be practical and say, okay, practically, what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we do that? I think Hebrews gives us a lot of practical advice of this is how you do that. This is what you should do so that you can teach and correct without inflaming and without crushing your children. Let's, let's work through these things together. First of all, and this, this is the, the foundation. And if you get the foundation right, it doesn't matter how strong the building is, right? The, the foundation of discipline is, I think, what your motivation is for doing it. Why are you doing it? What, what's driving you? What's the impulse that's pushing you to discipline your children? Um, can you write down the motivation for discipline is love. Hebrews 12, 6 you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening, the discipline of the Lord. Don't be discouraged when you're rebuked by him because whoever the Lord loves, that's the ones he disciplines. So why is, is the writer, and this is actually from the Psalms, why is the, the, the Bible saying don't be discouraged, don't be disheartened when you're disciplined? Because what's the motivation behind the discipline? Say it with me. What's the motivation behind the discipline? Love. Love. The, the whole foundation is don't, don't lose heart, don't be discouraged, because what God is doing to you in, in this passage and what our, in, in, in illustration, what your parents are disciplining you, they're disciplining you out of love. Now, now parents, let me just talk to us for a second. There's a whole lot of motivations that push us to discipline our children. There's a whole lot of less worthy motivations. It's easy to be embarrassed by, your, by the behavior of your children. So you're in public, and something that you allow them to do at home, you, you put up with, you tolerate, you don't make a big deal about it at home, all of a sudden there are other people watching, and they do the same thing that you've taught them is okay to do at home, now there are other people watching, and how do you react? How, how could you do that? What's wrong with you? What are you doing? Because now you're embarrassing me. See, see the difference? That's not disciplining out of love. You, you're not loving your child, and so you're disciplining. You're embarrassed, and so you're disciplining them. There's, there's a little thing called anger that sometimes motivates us to discipline, where they're doing something that we've, we've addressed, we've addressed, we've addressed, and so finally we, we get so frustrated and so built up with anger that that is the impulse. That's the spark that pushes forward the discipline. I want to make a distinction, something that, that in my mind is a very clear-cut distinction. A lot of us, we, we slide into punishment instead of discipline. Punishment looks back at what was done. 
Punishment is about you did this, and because of what you did, this is what you're going to get. Discipline, on the other hand. Discipline looks forward at what can become. Thank you. I think it's good, too. Discipline looks forward at what can become. You, you see, outwardly, they might look very much alike. Punishment and dis discipline externally might look very similar. But from your heart and from your motivation, why you're doing what you're doing, there's worlds of difference between the two of those. If you're looking back at, with anger or frustration or embarrassment at what your children did and that's what's driving you, you're punishing them for what they did. This is what jails are for, is punishment for what someone did. Parents are called to something better than this. We're not called to punish our children for what they did. This is where forgiveness comes in. This is where grace and mercy comes in. You, you ought to be parents that forgive your children, that, that demonstrate what you did hurt me, what you did angered me, what you did frustrated me, what you did embarrassed me. And yet I can forgive you and I'm gonna give you the forgiveness that God has given to me. However, I also love you. See, love drives us to discipline. And because I love you, I can't just say, I'm not gonna do anything about that. So even though I forgive you, and it's not about my anger and my frustration and my embarrassment, because I love you, I am going to get involved in your life at this situation. I'm going to do something about what I see in your heart. I'm going to do something about your character. And so discipline says, I, this is the goal. This is what I want you to become. This is the kind of person that I want to teach you and raise you to be. And therefore, this is what I'm going to do to try to help you in the future become somebody different than you are. Punishment looks at what was past. Discipline looks to the future at what can become. Which then begs the question, as parents, what are we supposed to making, be, be working to make our children become? What's the goal? Where are, we, where are we taking our children? What are we raising our children to be? There's a certain lightheartedness, and, and at, there are days that I certainly feel the same, where, where the joke is, as long as they're, if I get them 18 and they survive and get out of my house alive, I, I succeeded as a parent. I did my job. And there are some days it probably feels like that. Let, my job as a parent is just to get them alive to 18, and then congratulations, I did it. But, but if we're honest, that's, that's just lighthearted talk, right? We're called to a lot more than that. We're trying, to, we're trying to shape them. We're trying to mold them. Trying to teach them what's important in life. I say we're trying to. We are. You are teaching your children what's important in life. You're teaching your children what gives and what doesn't give. You're teaching your children what's, what's worth crying about, what's worth staying up late at night about, what's worth obsessing about. You're, you're modeling that for your children. You're teaching your children how to love a woman or how to love a man. You're teaching your children how to treat their children. You are giving all of this information to your children. So you're either doing it well and you're doing it intentionally or you're doing it unintentionally. You're doing it without thinking much about it. You're, you're just passing it on blindly to your children. So what's the goal of discipline? If the motivation, what's pushing it is love, where is love pushing it towards? I think for a lot of parents, when, when they think about their kids, probably a lot of times it becomes physical. It becomes temporal. This, this world kind of goals. The education I want my kids to get, the career I want my kids to get, the, the money. Isn't that sad? That, that for so many parents, for me, the temptation is just, how are my kids going to get enough money? How can my kids make money? So I've got to get them an education. I've got to point them in a career. I've got to, I've got to push them in a direction. My, my obsession with my children as they, as they leave my home is to make sure they're, they're headed to make money. Again, we can do better than that, parents. We, we must do better than that. that. We're thinking together about what our true home is, right? 
Where are we really headed for? And Hebrews 11 talks about that. It's this chapter of person after person after person who, who said, my home is in heaven. And so I'm going to live this life like my home is in heaven. And then another person said, my home is in heaven. I have no eternal dwelling place. I have no home here. My home is there. And so everything I do here is going to reflect that I belong there. And then Hebrews 12 starts to say, since we have that kind of a cloud of witnesses, means Abraham and Enoch and Moses, these people are watching us run this race. Yesterday, I have to confess, I walked a couple times during my, during my leg. I had some big hills, to my credit, okay? But, but I always tried to walk when I knew no one was watching. So once I got into the woods, you know, I'd, I'd, keep, I'd keep trucking until I made it past the wood line. And then I was, <sighs> and it was a real motivator when, you know, there's a, I'd see a little uh, Red Cross wagon, what are they, uh, ambulance up there. I'd see that and I'd pick up my pace and start running again. And, and in a sense, that's what the author of Hebrews is saying is you've got people watching you. Don't walk. You've got people who have run the race before you, who have set home, heaven as their eternal home, and they're watching you. So since we have this cloud of witnesses, this arena full of people of faith who have run the race of faith and finished the race of faith, and now they're watching us run the race of faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which tangles us up and run with endurance. What does that have to do with parenting? Parents, our, our job is to teach kids to be good runners. They're going to leave our influence. At, at some point, 18, 20, 25 years, they're going to leave our authority, leave our parenting. And, and you may have taught them a lot of education. You may have taught them a, a great life skill so they can make lots of money. You may have taught them to be really good at sports. You may have taught them a great curveball or a great home run hit or a touchdown pass, but have you taught them how to run the race of faith? Have you taught them, this is what it means, this is what it looks like, this is how to lay aside the sin, this is how to lay aside the weight, this is how to run the race? Or are you setting out people who are out of shape spiritually? Are you sending people out of your home who are not at all prepared to run the race? Our goal as parents is to teach our kids and prepare them to run the race. We have a spiritual responsibility to our children. I think one of the best ways that you can teach and prepare your children to run the race is to teach them more about God's authority than your own authority. Sometimes we get, we get really big on, you know, you, you'll start thinking about discipline, yeah, I'm going to lay down the law, and I'm going to really, I'm going to teach them, and I'm going to be the, the boss in my home. They're going to they're gonna do whatever I say. It begins to be I, 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 I. And, and you, can, you can run a home that way. You're going to damage your children, but you can run a home that way. But eventually, you're not going to have that kind of control over your kids. That's temporary. And it's harmful. But you can't do that all their lives. You can't control them all their lives. We're going to talk about teenagers in two weeks. And I've asked uh, different people in the congregation to help me out with that because I don't have teenagers yet. There's, especially as they get older, there's a lot more of this transition from obey me to think with me, talk with me, reason with me about life together. But as, as you have young children, there's a, there's a lot that just has to be taught of this is the rule and you need to obey it. This is the standard, this is the expectation, and you need to submit to that. You need to come under authority. But parents, if you're going to prepare your children to run the race, the, the more you can push your children past yourself of this is what I say, this is my rule, this is what I have to, this is my authority in your life, the more you can push to your 
to God and say, this is what God's word says, this is what God has to say, this is what the Bible says, that opens their eyes to not just an 18-year prison term of obeying your rules, to, to open their eyes to say, wait a minute, I'm God's child as much as I am my parents' child. So I've got to follow their, I've got to follow God's guidelines and I've got to come under God's authority. And that doesn't end in 18 years. That is a lifelong race that I'm running. That's a lifelong pursuit of holiness. Let me, let me give you two reasons, especially why this is important to teach them about God's authority. Your authority is borrowed. God's is absolute. There's a lot of people who who would disagree with some of the things I've already said and are going to disagree with things I'm about to say. Because their thinking is that a parent intrinsically doesn't have any real authority over a child. That a parent and a child are both human beings. The child has every bit as much rights as the parent has. And so it's not an authority position. It's just a nurturing and take care of position until they can make their own decisions. So the parent doesn't have the right to exercise authority over a, a child. You're just there to nurture and raise the child. And in a sense, they're, they're plugging into this that, that a parent's authority is not intrinsic to the parent. There's nothing about the fact that, that one human being is big and another human being is small that says, you get to be the boss over this person. But there's a, a borrowed authority that God gives to parents to say, while a child is in your home, you don't have intrinsic authority. You understand what I'm saying by intrinsic? It means you don't have authority just because you, of who you are or just because you're smarter or you're bigger or you're older. That doesn't make you an authority over this child, but you have authority given to you by God as your parents are in your home to, to raise them, as Ephesians says, to teach them and instruct them, to discipline them and train them. That's a, a God-given responsibility. So if you take God and God's authority out, which many people take God and God's authority out of their picture, then they just have two human beings. And they say, well, the little human being's rights are just as important as the big human being's rights. And the whole concept of parenting and parental authority becomes up for grabs. Spiritually, God has absolute authority. God as intrinsic because of who he is. He's not just a big human being and we're small human beings. Am I losing you? A lot of people are looking around here. God has absolute authority. We have borrowed authority. Um, let, me, let me say one more thing about that. Therefore, because God's authority is absolute and ours is borrowed, our authority is all the more authoritative when we build it on God's authority. The more you can tell your children, this is what God says, this is God's rules, this is what God has given to us, the more authority you speak with. If, if you don't like blue and you just start saying to your kids, you're, not, you're never allowed to wear blue, well, why? Because dad doesn't like blue. Okay, you have borrowed authority, maybe you can say that, but that's not gonna carry a lot of weight. You follow what I'm saying? Whereas, if you say, you're not allowed to do this, and they say, why? Because scripture says, da, 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 da. Now, what you're, the rule you've come up with has real authority behind it, and not just borrowed authority behind it. So parents, constantly push your kids and push your discipline of your kids back to scripture. Show your kids why they're being disciplined comes from the Bible. Which, guess what that means? When you discipline your kids, it needs to come from scripture. It can't just be because I feel like it, because I had a bad day at work, which goes back to what's the motivation for discipline. It's because we love our kids. Not because, we had a, not because our boss was mean to us, and so we're gonna come home and be mean to our kids. Your authority is borrowed, God's is absolute. Uh, we had a, a, a poster on our door for a long time that had five verses on it. And all of those verses translated into rules for our house. Do everything without arguing and complaining. That's a verse in the Bible. So, so that becomes a rule in the home. And when the, parent, when the children break that rule, now they see 
right there, you're not, just, you're not just breaking a rule that mom and I came up with. You are breaking God's commandment. However, let me say this, parents, God's rules apply to you as much as they do to your children. So if you're going to push your children, which you should, to say God's authority is over you, there's a, there's a lifeline here for your kids that you're not a dictator who gets to make up whatever rules you want and treat them however you want. They also have a, have a court of appeals, scripture. That also gives them the authority to say, do you know what God's word says? Do everything without arguing and complaining. Therefore, when your boss does things to you and you come home and complain, they've got God's word on their side just like you've got God's word on your side. And so if you're going to apply God's word to your children and say, this is, this is what the Bible says, this is a standard of what scripture says, be willing and be ready to also submit to God's standard of scripture. Bring yourself also under that authority. And, and that, that brings us to the next one. Your authority is flawed, God's is perfect. Kids, I know some of you have tuned out because this is just boring parent talk, so let me get you to tune back in for a second. I've told you before, kids, your parents are going to make mistakes. Your parents are going to mess up. Not because they're mean and not because they're bad parents, but because they're human, just like you're human. You mess up, your parents mess up. God never messes up. God never disciplines in the wrong way or for the wrong reason or to the wrong measure to the wrong degree and so as your parents mess up you need to you need to be forgiving to them just like they forgive you when you mess up when they mess up you need to forgive them as well parents there is nothing wrong with telling your children you messed up there's nothing wrong with asking your children to forgive you for messing up they know you mess up you know you mess up just get it out in the open and admit that you've messed up. It, it gives you credibility when you're willing to own it and tell your children, you know what, I blew it. I was wrong. What I did was wrong. Because then when, when you're treating them, they know you're, that you also answer to a higher authority, that you also come under God's authority. Let me say another thing with this. God's authority is flawed, but ours is, or, or our, <laughs> Wow. Our authority is flawed and God's authority is perfect. It's hard preaching to a huge group of people. I mentioned this in men's Bible study. It feels like inevitably the people, bear with me here, the people that need a kick in the pants are so stiff-headed that when I'm trying to give a kick into the pants to this one group, the sensitive group is the people that hear me and they're like, oh man, I'm such a terrible parent, I need to do better. <laughs> And some of you are, are so conscientious and are working so hard at your parenting skills and your parenting. And I feel like you're going to go away thinking, man, I'm just a failure. I've messed up again. I need to do better. Oh, all that applies to me. Every single point I'm wrong on. And I want you to hear. Now, you, you stiff-headed people, just close your ears for a second. <laughs> I didn't look at you on purpose, Ben. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to hear. That, that God knows that you make mistakes as a parent and that God can, can undo the mistakes that you make. Your, your children's destiny is not solely in your hands. They have a father in heaven who loves them even more than you do. And he is watching out for them and he is taking care of them. And so so when you make a mistake and when you do something wrong, you have not permanently ruined their lives for the rest of eternity because God is greater than your mistakes. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> God can fix the mistakes that you make. See, some of you stiff-headed people are thinking, oh, good. So I don't need to change at all. I can just keep doing what I'm doing and let God clean up the mess. No. Your authority is flawed and God's is perfect. Let's go to the nature of discipline. So, the motivation, the spark behind it is love. The goal is to prepare them to run a race of faith, to, to build a relationship between your kids and ultimately between your kids and God. And to prepare to, to in a sense, be removed from that, 
from that line of authority, for you to come alongside them as a fellow runner on the, on the race of faith. The nature of discipline, I, I think it's great how, how the author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12. It says, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present. If your kids are enjoying the discipline, you're doing it wrong, okay? No discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Discipline is painful. God's discipline to his children is painful. And he's following along here and he's saying, parents discipline to their children is painful, but afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So it's painful, but it's profitable. There, it's worth the pain. It's difficult, but it's worth it. Um, here we go. Proverbs mentions the rod five times in relation to disciplining children. And I am well aware that this is a part of scripture that is not popular anymore. This is a part of, of biblical teaching that has been eclipsed by the wisdom of modern parents. Let me just ask you, how are, how are we doing as parents? How is modern parenting doing? Scripture says five times throughout Proverbs. 1324, he who spares the rod hates his son. Now, now you can make the argument there's a cultural thing here, and so, so the author of Proverbs is talking about discipline in general, and he's using the particular image of a rod to, to represent discipline. So you can say, okay, well, when he says rod, what he really means is discipline, and there's lots of different ways to discipline. You can make that argument. But in my mind, the burden of proof rests on those who do not use some kind of painful discipline instead of those who do use painful discipline. Scripture in Hebrews and throughout Proverbs talks about physical pain of discipline. 13.24, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. 22.15 says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. 23, 13, and 14, do not withhold correction from a child, for if you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You will strike him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. So Proverbs is saying, the, the pain that you're causing is profitable because it's, it's avoiding so much greater tragedy in that child's life. Probably my favorite is Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. Um, let me just say two sides of this. I know in this church family there are those who, who don't believe it's right in any way to cause physical pain as a part of discipline. Um, I disagree with you. I, I think... Biblically, there's the, there's the groundwork for it, and, and like I said, you can argue it's just representative of discipline in general. But there's a certain, there's, a, there's an age of children that, that you cannot reason with and intellectually meet them and say, I'm going to discuss with you and intellectually reason with you why this is right and why this is wrong. There's a, there's a part of parenting that is teaching authority. God's authority over us and parents' authority over children and teaching submission to that authority. There's also, when, when Paul talks about the, the, the job of parents is to teach and discipline, there's certainly a part of parenting that means you reason with them and you come along and you explain to them and you talk through their feelings and you talk through why they're doing what they're doing and what's behind the behavior where you try to address that and you try to get them to verbalize that and help them verbalize that. But there are times in our lives as well as our children's lives where it is not an issue of not understanding or not knowing. It's just an understanding. It's an issue of I don't want to do what I know is right to do. 
You can sit and talk to me about it. You can explain it to me. You can tell me about how, how it's better for me and how this is good and how that's good. But it comes down to, no, I don't want to do that. I understand. I want to do this. That is a time for painful discipline. That is a time for painful correction. Because it's not an issue of explain it to me again. Talk me through it again. It's an issue of, in my heart, I understand what you're saying, and I don't want to do that. I know you've said no. I don't care. I'm going to say yes. That's a time to not address the mind, but to address the heart, to address the will. Let me say to the other group, I've, as, as, as a pastor, a pastor's wife, we've heard a lot of people, we've heard enough people to make an imprint on my mind, say, I've tried spanking and it doesn't work. Often when I've seen families, what I've seen people use as an excuse for spanking breaks my heart a lot of times. And my hunch is that's what they mean when they say, I've tried spanking. Um, when a parent just in the middle of somewhere grabs the child's arm and just starts whacking on the bottom, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That is... That is shameful behavior. You're going to make your child angry doing that. You're not going to address the heart. You're not going to change behavior. You're not going to change their heart. You're, you're just going to embarrass them and make them angry at you. Swatting, slapping, hitting, those kinds of things are not spanking. Those kinds of things are not what Scripture is talking about when it says, spare the rod and you, will, you hate your son. So, so let me explain exactly what I believe biblically is a, is, a, is a guideline and patterns. First of all, if you're going to use painful discipline, which I would call spanking, it needs to be motivated by love. It ought to be, I'm not angry at the child, I'm not frustrated at my child, I'm not irritated or embarrassed. That's not what's driving me to do this. And a lot of times when you see someone just grab their kid and start hitting them, it's not a loving, conscious decision of this is what I think is best for my child right now. It's all these other motivations that's driving that. So the motivation ought to be love, not anger, not frustration, not embarrassment. Take the time to root that stuff out. Those are, those are common emotions. Don't don't beat yourself up because you get angry. Some of the things your children do would make anybody angry. It's not that you're a bad father or a bad mother because you get angry at your children. But take time to resolve that, to, to weed that out and say, okay, I forgive you. This is not about me being angry anymore. There's an issue on your, in your life and in your heart that now needs to be addressed. So, so begin with love. Make sure that the discipline you give your child is because you love them, because you want what's best for them, because you want to help them. That right there eliminates 90%. If, if you will start with that principle, that eliminates 90% of the, of the nonsense that gets labeled as spanking. Number two, this, this isn't biblical, but I believe it should be done in private. We're trying to do what's good for our children. And I don't think it's good to embarrass or shame your kids in front of everybody else. So, so I believe if, if discipline needs to be done, you should take them in private and do it privately. Especially with fathers and daughters, it might be appropriate to have the mother involved. I'm not saying it has to be just one parent with one child, but don't do it in public. Don't do it, don't shame the child. And don't, don't use shame and embarrassment in parenting. There's much better ways to parent than to try to publicly embarrass your child for what they've done. Number three, explain. And, and that comes from Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. A child ought to know why they're being spanked, what they're being spanked for, what they did. There ought to be explanation of this is the rule, this is what you did, and this is why it not only breaks my rules, but this is how it connects back to God. Now, uh, your child doesn't have to 
agree with you on that. There are times that we've explained things, and though our children intellectually understand, they don't agree with our assessment of it. But they understand our side of it. Explain yourself, explain what they did wrong, and how your discipline is going to address that. How your discipline, how you hope to fix that, and what, you're trying, what your goal is. Talk about the future. Talk about what you're trying to build and not just what is in the past. Remember? Discipline and correction, discipline and punishment. Talk about this is where I want you to go. This is where, what I want you to be. Love, privacy, explain, and then spank. One of the things, this is again not biblical, it's just preference. We always tell our children how many times we're going to spank them. Because we don't want to get carried away in the moment. We don't want it to be about, I'm going to break you until you cry or anything. You've done this. I'm going, you're going to get this many spankings for what you've done. It's a, it's a controlled, it's not an emotional reaction. You know what I'm saying? It's a controlled decision of saying, because of what you've done, this is what the discipline you're going to get for your good. And this is a very debatable one. A lot of people will use... Um, a stick, a wooden spoon, or something like that. The idea is you want your hands always to be for love, but guess what? Your hand is behind the wooden spoon. Uh, Daylin and I use our hands, and we use our hands because we want to feel what they're feeling. Uh, I think if you're using another object, it's easy to go harder and harder and not realize how much it's hurting them because you're not actually feeling the impact yourself. So we use our hands so that we can feel the sting. We can feel the pain that they're feeling. So we have a gauge of this is how hard it is and can judge that accordingly. And then number five, restore. I got this from my parents. I never got a spanking that afterwards I wasn't hugged and told that I, that I was loved. So, so the, I look back on those spanking times and those are reinforcements of my parents' love for me. I, I remember my parents' love because that was, a, that was a message all the way from beginning to end. This was about their love. In the middle, it was about their love. You know the old line that's hurting more, me more than it hurts you? And then at the end, there was a hug and I was told that I was loved. And I was restored again to my parents. We practice this with our children as well. Different people are different in their personalities. Some people aren't going to want to be huggy and lovey and, and real mushy-gushy right after you've spanked them. It's fine if they don't want to hug you back. It's fine if they don't want to talk about how much they love you. That's, that's understandable. It's not okay in our house, and you've got to figure this out for yourself, it's not okay in our house for our kids to continue to be angry after discipline. To be, to be hurt or to be crying and sad is understandable. But, but if we sense that there's still this, this heart of anger and bitterness, then we address it again, and we come back, and we, we go back through discipline again. And so take that for what it's worth. Last thing, I want to just talk to the children as we close. Ephesians uh, or verse 11 says, No chastening, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, so the idea is kids, your parents can do all the discipline they want, but if you refuse to be trained by their discipline, you can make all of it a waste. And, and if it were me, and, and all this discipline can either work for me and be profitable for me, or it can be wasted on me, isn't it a lot better for it to be profitable? You, kids, you decide how, how effective your parents' discipline is. If, if you bunker down and say, I don't care what they tell me, I don't care what they do to me, I'm going to do what I want to do, then, then all of their discipline, all of the love that your parents try to give you can be wasted and can be no good. What's interesting is I, I, just that last phrase in there, this applies to everyone. I know some of you don't have children. Some of you don't have children yet, and some of you don't have children in your home anymore. And I appreciate you being part of the church family and, and joining us in this, in this topic. 
But Hebrews 12 isn't actually written to parents. You remember that? Hebrews 12 was written to you. Hebrews 12 was written to every one of us, saying whether you have children or are disciplining your children or not disciplining children, God is disciplining you. So do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Every one of us has things in our life that God has put there to discipline us, to mold us, to shape us, to help us run the race of faith. And the the overarching message of Hebrews 12 is don't despise that, don't hate that, don't, don't look back and say, God, I wish you would stop, but instead... Verse, verse 12, therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Strengthen your hands and your feeble knees. So, so my prayer is, whether you're a parent or not, whether all of the parenting stuff applies to you or not, that you will, that you will strengthen your hands that hang down, that you will continue running the race of faith that you will strengthen the feeble knees. Can, could you stand together with me? I want to read from Hebrews 13 and dismiss this as a, as a church. Uh, Josh, can you get Hebrews 13, 20, and 21 up in uh, the New King James? We've just been talking about Hebrews 12, and then there's a really beautiful... Uh, prayer, benediction that, that the author gives in the, at the end of the chapter, end of the book that I want to pray and, and read together. Hebrews thirteen twenty says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlast, everlasting covenant, may he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much.